Hello, listeners. Hello. And welcome again to Film Swap, the uh, podcast where we take a big slice of classic cinema and uh, recommend those hidden gems and forgotten classics to you so you can uh, go out and uh, discover them for yourselves. Uh, my name is David Seeley. And uh, just sitting across from me is my uh, good friend, uh, the man. The, oh. uh... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> is my uh, uh, co-host, uh, a man with uh, a great uh, skill and daring who uh, uh, can give you a great thrust of a fabulous factoid and then parry with a witty rejoiner. And uh, his name is Jonathan Pritchard Barrett. Johnny, me. how are you doing? I'm doing very well, thank you. Looking forward to our film swap today, David? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, today's theme we've chosen is cinematic swordplay. So, uh, Jonathan, what have you got for me this time? Uh, David, the film I'm recomm recommending to you is The Duelists by Ridley Scott, <clears throat> and it's actually his first film. He was uh, a copywriter and sort of made adverts uh, yeah, before uh, he got into movies, and he was famous for a Hobbit advert, especially. Um, and uh, this is his first film after uh, his sort of successful career in advertising. And um, it's a terrific film, made in 1977, or released in 1977. And it stars um, Harvey Keitel and Keith Carradine. It also has in it Albert Finney, Diana Quick, Edward Fox, and a number of other very talented people. And it's set during the Napoleonic War, and it's about two duelists. So there we go. Oh, fantastic. That's a great film. I'm looking forward to uh, watching that again and having a chat about it. Uh, my film for you uh, this evening, Jonathan, is a perhaps an all-time classic of Japanese cinema. It's the uh, 1962 film uh, known in the West as Harry Carey. Uh, I guess the, the correct title, the Japanese title is... Seppuku. Seppuku. Seppuku, Thank you. I think. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, anyway, that, that is uh, uh, the uh, correct Japanese title, but it's known... It was distributed originally in the West as Harry Carey, because I guess that term is more, uh, I guess, widely known. Um, anyway, it uh, was directed by the great Masaki Kobayashi, who's uh, one of the great masters of Japanese cinema. Uh, his, his, it, this is one of his uh, major uh, sort of seminal titles. Uh, he's also famous for, for directing a, a, an anthology of ghost stories called Kwaidan. And, uh, and he's also, he directed a film called Semen, uh, Samurai Rebellion, which is also quite classic. And he also did a, uh, a, a, an amazing uh, World War II epic called The Human Condition. Uh, so he's quite a major figure in Japanese uh, cinema. Uh, and this, as I said, is one of his seminal titles, uh, an all time classic. And uh, I'm uh, going to recommend that uh, for Jonathan today. Brilliant. Sounds great. Never seen it. Ne never actually even heard of it. Oh, my goodness. Well, <laughs> never heard of the guy. In that case, uh, <laughs> I've, I've literally just saved your life. <laughs> I think you might have done. So, uh, so on that note, uh, uh, listeners, what we're going to do now is we're going to go away. Um, Mrs. Uh, Smith down the road is currently uh, throwing a white bed sheet over the clothesline and we're getting out the old eight millimeter projector and we're going to thread that up with the films and uh, after that we're going to come on back and we're going to talk about our impressions of these uh, two classic films, Cinematic yeah. Swordplay. I look so, forward to nipping down to the backyard for our listeners in North America. We're going to go and take a stab at watching these films right now, and uh, we shall come back in a little while and, and have a chat about them. So we'll Sounds see good. you on the other side. See you on the other side. Um, one thing I think what somebody said was 
I think we need to sort of speak quickly or not too slowly, yeah. not too ponderously. Um, so <laughs> try, and, try and remember that. Anyway, yeah, like I said, in the very first episode, Jono, I listened to it and like that, that was the key thing is I, I thought it sounded like we were on sedatives. <laughs> And, you know, and well, the first one, because I I had to sort of write the subtitles or edit the subtitles for this Nigella Lawson video, oh, and she was right. making pancakes. And as she says, you know, the thing is, the first pancake is always a mess. And so, <laughs> but don't be worried about that. That's just what happens. So I still thought, well, it's the same with podcasts. First podcast, you know, doesn't come out quite right, but you've got to make it. Hopefully, we haven't alienated too many listeners <laughs> uh, in the meantime. Exactly. <laughs> All right, on that note, shall we come back then? Yeah. <laughs> Let's do that. And we're back. We're back, yes. What, what uh, two terrific films? They were fantastic, actually. I, I love them. I actually uh, had seen The Duelist uh, uh, before the, the, that you've kindly recommended tonight, but I have to say it had been a while and uh, I really had forgotten just how uh, how interesting a film it is. Yeah, it really is. Um, so, um, yeah, great the, the, yeah, the, the main thing uh, that I took away from it, uh, uh, the, the beautiful photography in it is kind of the key thing and just the atmosphere and the kind of the attention to detail with kind of the uniforms and the, you know, mm. the, uh, the buildings and the, the, the sort of different uh, scenarios that they're in with, with the soldiers and the war. Uh, it also struck me with uh, Harvey Keitel, because it's quite interesting, I guess, uh, for the benefit of the listeners who haven't seen the film before, uh, the, the film is, is apparently based on a true story. It's actually based on a Joseph Conrad uh, story, I believe. It is. Which in turn was based on an actual factual story about a, a couple of gents who who went through over the course of like sort of a, a you know, 15, 20 year period of constantly having these duels. Yeah, um, that's true. And I... uh, and so the, the story goes uh, that, that these gents uh, continuously kind of kept challenging each other to duels. And, and having these duels and it went on for years until finally one of them managed to convince the other that uh, that it was time to stop okay <laughs> so that, that that is basically the crux of, of the actual events uh, the film uh, it obviously fictionalizes it it doesn't use the real names I don't think no uh, and uh, the, the basic premise of the film is uh, Harvey Keitel's character I don't know, how should we put it? I guess in today's terms, they might refer to him as someone with toxic masculinity. Uh, he's he's a very uh, uh, kind of a bully and a, and a boorish character. And yeah. he, uh, he, won, he, he seems to like to, he's very competitive in the extreme. And what he does is he uh, likes to go around and challenge people uh, to competitions of one kind or another. At one point, he's, he's shown arm wrestling guys, and he's he, so he has this sort of hyper active need for for competitiveness and to uh, assert his manliness and his superiority. He's basically a over. thug. He's, he's, pretty he's much... a thug. Yes. <laughs> and what I was going to say about Harvey Keitel, because I know this is something. And, this, and in no way is meant to be uh, to be smirch him in any way, because I quite like Harvey Keitel quite a bit. But I, I do think about the fact that he does tend to gravitate in a lot of his films to playing very unlikable characters. He does. <laughs> they're, he does. they're not necessarily, because usually when an actor plays someone with this kind of complexity, they tend to try and sort of make them, uh, you know, maybe a little bit likable so the audience can identify them with them in some way and to have some sort of a connection with them. But I don't think Harvey Keitel does that. He just goes for it, doesn't he? He makes his characters truly sort of really unlikable, unpleasant, yes. kind of boorish yeah. people. Not yeah. always. I mean, there are exceptions to that. I mean, I think he's quite good in Blue Collar. And, and some other films as well. 
Um, and he's someone he's had quite a kind of a checkered career because he kind of came up in the 70s, didn't he? And he, yep. had, he got quite a few lead roles. I would yep. say The Duelist is kind of at the tail end of that because I think just after he did this film, he did Coppola's uh, Apocalypse Now. And uh, I, I believe he ended up getting the sack, didn't he? He sort of... Uh, uh, he was it. in it before, uh, early on, was he? Uh, yeah, I believe I believe that's a story. I mean, it's been a while, but, uh, but um, I believe Harvey Keitel was originally the star of Apocalypse Now. But okay. at a certain point, they basically sacked him off because, right. uh, you know, for whatever reason, because he was being difficult to work with or, yeah. because, I don't know, they just decided he wasn't right from the right. it wasn't working and they decided to, to get somebody else. But, but uh, and then I believe after that, his career sort of went into a bit of the doldrums uh, for right. a few years and he spent a few years kind of just doing more sort of little bit parts and, and he, he, his career kind of had, had started to fade a little bit. And then he did the, that film with uh, Abel Ferreira, The Bad Lieutenant, oh, yeah. which which then sort of rejuvenated his career and okay. kind, of, kind of got him back, uh, you know, got him lots of attention and, this, and, and acclaim and things. And it actually kind of rejuvenated his career and he started doing a, a lot more films and more sort of lead parts yeah. and things again after yeah. that. Uh, but he is a very good actor. He's a very intense actor, isn't he? Super he seems intense. to be a very intense person. Uh, and so he's kind of perfect in this role because he is this guy who just, he's like a dog with a bone. Yeah. And, and the, the film starts out with him in a duel with somebody and he ends up uh, actually quite seriously injuring this chap. Uh, and yeah. as a consequence, uh, his commanding officer decides to put him under a house arrest. Uh, and uh, uh, Carradine's character uh, gets sent to inform him and collect him and tell him, hey, you have to go back home, you're under house arrest. And Harvey Keitel, for whatever reason, takes such umbrage to this news and this, you know, he basically fixates on the messenger and says, yeah. you've offended me, sir. And he challenges him to a duel right then and there. Very much and, the mes messenger, not the message. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. And this leads to this kind of obsession with dueling with this individual. And he almost, he, he just basically, well, I guess today you would term it stalking, <laughs> really. Yeah, he's like, obsessed. He, he is obsessed. He, it's like a sort is, of OCD is. thing. It is, and he just he ha he just wants to duel this guy and best him and get the better of him. And so, yeah. what happens through the course of the film is they have this series of duels, uh, and, which uh, become increasingly sort of um, you know uh, violent, and bloody. John Carradine's character is very much. Um, sorry, am I getting the right Carradine? Because there's so many Carradine brothers uh, Keith, that I. Keith. It's Keith. I'm sorry. Yes, see, I knew it. I knew I was one. getting the wrong one there. As Didn't soon as I said it, I said, "No, wait a minute," uh, because he's obviously part of the Carradine dynasty, isn't he? His father was a yes. was one of the great uh, actors in the kind of golden age of of uh, Hollywood there, yeah. and uh, and then him and his brothers have all uh, uh, had uh, quite. Uh, long and, and uh, interesting careers in film. So I quite often get the names muddled up about which one's which. Yeah, so yeah. Apologies, Keith. So this is Keith Carradine, and he's a really great actor. He's been in a lot of really great films as well, yep. uh, this included. And uh, so his character is someone who he, he tries to avoid this guy. And they're in the army, so they get sort of promoted and they get moved around because this is set during the Napoleonic Wars. It is. So From there is 1801 a... to 1816, I think is the sort of time time frame of the film. Yeah, and it doesn't really dwell too much on Napoleon and all, on the campaigns and the, the the actual sort of war so much. That's almost just kind of a backdrop yeah. to the situations that these characters find them in because they're they're soldiers and they're kind of career soldiers. It seems they're not just sort of uh, you know, uh, conscripts or anything, but they're actual sort of career soldiers who are in the army for sort of you know years and years, and they get promoted up into senior positions and things. But throughout this thing, Harvey Keitel's character just keeps finding him and challenging him to duels. <laughs> yeah. Keith Carradine tries to avoid him, but he can't, so he always ends up getting into these uh, these uh, situations with him. 
So that that's the basic uh, pl plot, if you will, of the film. And uh, stylistically, the film very much seems to uh, have taken a leaf from Stanley Kubrick's Barry Lyndon, because yeah, I yeah. think stylistically, uh, attention to detail with the costumes and the scenery and the really lush photography, really beautiful um, cine cinematography. There's a lot of shots that are kind of based on famous paintings yeah. where where the, the backdrops were, they, they sort of took the, the shots of the film in the same places where these paintings were done, or they've set up a, a scene in a, in a room or something that looks like a famous painting. So there's a lot of that going on. So I think they very much were sort of taking a leaf from Stan Kubrick's book there when they made this. I think it, this film kind of was only made a, maybe two or three years after Barry Lyndon was released. I think Barry Lyndon yeah. was 75, wasn't it? Yeah. So so I think that it obviously had a huge influence. Well, Barry Lyndon was very much influenced by Hogarth and the sort of 18th century paintings. And I mm. think that sort of this one, he wasn't afraid to look at paintings for inspiration. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, it, and you know what, I love it. I love the look of the film and I love beautiful. some of those moments because uh, it's really, uh, c c quite uh, striking images throughout, and yeah. uh, but um, the the story is still quite uh, riveting and, and interesting. The the characterizations uh, they they spend a lot of time developing. Well, Keith Carradine's character anyway. I don't think so much with Harvey Keitel. Uh, I think his character seems. Can I to be give you my different. theory about um, Harvey Keitel? Um, you can. Well, his please. his character. So hmm. yeah. Keith Carradine's character is called Armand Dubert, and um, Harvey Keitel is Gabriel Ferro. And actually, part of my research for the film was um, for the for the for this uh, podcast was I actually listened to the book. I didn't have time to read it, but you can download it for free from um, the free uh, audiobook uh, website. So I listened to it. It's only four ch short chapters, so not that long. Uh, and I would say the film is pretty faithful to the Joseph Conrad's book. <clears throat> and the, definitely the, film, the book is seen through the eyes of Armand Dubert. Um, and uh, Harvey, Keitel, uh, Harvey Keitel's character is much more sort of, uh, I guess, not peripheral, but he's, he, it's, not, it's not really his story. Um, and the interesting thing, one of the interesting uh, things in the film, in, in the book, is that uh, Dubert often calls the Harvey Keitel character a lunatic. In fact, three times he says, this lunatic, what's this lunatic going to do next? And, <laughs> uh, and he, that's sort of really what he is. He's just this sort of just crazed character, crazy and crazed. And I think that's where his um, the casting was actually really good. Although in, in, in the research, it turns out there was uh, an American uh, critic at the time, Gene Siskel for the Chicago uh, Tribune, I guess, uh, said he was too loutish, uh, Harvey, uh, Harvey Keitel, for a sort of more fine film like this. Actually, I don't think he is. He, he is a sort of like a, a New York gangster type character. And he'd previously been in Martin Scorsese's Mean Streets. But actually, I think that makes him ideally suited for the film because he is a sort of this crazy sort of lout, thug, um, lunatic, whatever word you want to use. And um, which, which you know, and he doesn't have a very deep character. He's just sort of, he's obsessed with fighting. You know, when he's not fighting for Napoleon, he's fighting uh, his worst enemy, uh, Armand Dubert. And so, yeah, I thought that worked uh, really well, actually, casting him in the world. Why do you think that he uh, fixated on this character? Because that's the thing that I was thinking about. Because, like you say, he's obviously a very competitive person and he just wants to, he's just angry and he just wants to fight everyone and prove something to whoever, to himself or to everybody else, I don't know. But why is it he chooses to fixate on this particular character? What is it about him? Well, I, ha I have a number of theories. 
Yeah, that is a very good question. I think one is that he's like a sort of fairy tale character. He doesn't really have any sort of psychological depth in a way. He's just this sort of thing that moves around the story, uh, just sort of attacking. <laughs> it's just like a sort of, uh, yeah, like like a sort of wicked witch or a sort of evil, you know, bad wolf, big bad wolf or something like that. Um, but another thing at the beginning of uh, the duelist, sorry, it's it's called the, actually it's called the duel, a military tale in the publication in England in America. It was called a point of honor. And part it's part of a collection of three, of, of, sorry, of six short stories. Anyway, um, the, this is. Let me just read the first um, short paragraph um, because it explains his character. Napoleon I, whose career had the quality of a duel against the whole of Europe, disliked, disliked dueling between officers of his army. The great military emperor was not a swashbuckler and had little respect for tradition. So it's quite a traditional thing. So I think basically, in a way, um, Dubert is sort of like Napoleon, he represents Napoleon's sort of scrappiness. He's like this little guy who wants to sort of take on <laughs> Europe, take on the monarchies of Europe. And sort of, uh, I think that's that's part of it as well. So he's, um, and then another thing, if you read the book, is that Ferro, because basically Joubert is a sort of, you know, uh, high, more high-born uh, sort of man, mm. uh, whereas uh, Ferro, Fur, fur, I think, is the French for iron. Anyway, he's the son of a um, blacksmith. I think, in fact, Fur or Marty means blacksmith. And so he's he's basically got this sort of uh, he's got this sort of pugnacious sort of perhaps a, you might say it's a bit of a chip on his shoulder. Basically, he's, he's got it in for the sort of the, the snooty uh, Dubert. So I think that might be a point of it as well. So um, yeah, these are these are the, sort of the my thinking behind that. Mm. And there's a lot of, uh, despite the, the kind of almost animalistic nature of some of the duels and the, the, the violence, yeah. um, there's a lot of uh, uh, trappings of ritual and, and rules. And, yes. Uh, you know, that there's one scene that's terrific when his friend goes away to, to speak to um to the other side to, to try and negotiate his way out of having to have another duel and then his friend comes back and says not only are you going to have to have the duel but you're going to have to do it on horseback <laughs> yes <laughs> of which something he's just completely sort of um, uncomfortable with because he, he's a, perhaps not an experienced uh, uh horse rider and, and all these things uh and they they discuss about the fact that well you have to do it because you you, you need to do it in in um, out of respect for the regiment and there's a, there's all these things about honor and uh, ritual yep. that surround uh, these these things whether which are essentially two guys you know Having trying to, yeah which we're is, trying to is trying to slice sort of, each other up <laughs> exactly well there's, that's one of the quotes I wrote down that he says honor it's indescribable unchallengeable <laughs> And I think that's one, one thing that the um, both both films have in common. Actually, this sort of yes. looking at this idea of honor, yes, and um, yeah, and the rituals and ceremony around that, and the, 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 the sort of the ideals exactly. uh, that are there on the surface, but then underneath is is a, a much more sort of basic uh, thing that's going on. Yeah, uh, but you're right. But I mean, when, when we talk about the other film, I think there are actually, um, and this wasn't conscious when I think when when we proposed these films to each other, but I think they both do have some similar themes running oh, through them. Yeah. yeah, so which make them quite an interesting pairing. Another thing that occurred to me is that when I wrote um, wrote that because these the sort of first, especially the first half of the films are punctuated by these duels. And I wrote down in my notes, more and more absurd. <laughs> and the funny thing is, when I then, after having watched the film, I went listening to the book, he, uh, Joseph Conrad, uh, puts the words in Armand Dubert's uh, sort of head a number of times. It's so absurd. This uh, dueling business is absurd. So I like, I love the style. I love the fact that uh, the beginning starts with these braid, the braid and the plaits in their hair and wearing cloaks and, you know, the, the women with the cleavage and it's just sort of, 
very stylish, amazingly so, and people are stylish. Um, I love the, the sword fight, especially, especially the sort of swish of the swords and the clank. I mean, this, the sound design in it is extraordinary, really banging swords. It's not sort of, mm. you know, well, yeah, really quite visceral. Um, and the, the realism of the wounds and things as well, because yeah. at various times they have to stop the fights because they, because that's part of the, the the interesting thing about the movie is that they they all have this duel and you think okay they're going to settle this once and for all one of them's going to kill the other or whatever yeah. but it never turns out that way they all have a duel one of something will happen to kind of stop it from progressing. Yeah. So then, then they then three years later they run into each other again, and it's like this unresolved sort of tension and thing that's always there. Despite being quite badly wounded, often uh, they yeah. somehow managed to get on. And um, so, uh, an another thing that um, I noticed uh, noted was that the, apparently the fights were choreographed by a chap called William Hobbs. Um, he was a sort of fight choreographer, film fight choreographer, and he started, uh, this is a nice bit of trivia, he started a um, fencing club called the Swash and Buckle Fencing Club, which, which still still exists to this day. Oh, brilliant. And apparently Jill, Gene Wilder was a, um honorary member. He, I don't think he actually fought in it because he became friends with... Uh, William Hobbs in one of the films they made together, and he's, he agreed to be the sort of honor, an honorary member of, of the club, which was quite fun. Oh, brilliant. Uh, and another thing... So I know um, what I'm doing this weekend, then. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Another thing that was I enjoyed was the locations. Um, a lot of it was shot in France. Apparently, this place called Sala uh, la Canadou, Canada? No, Canada. And it's in the Dordogne, it's this little village. And it looks a little bit like a sort of uh, Cotswolds village, really. It's sort of stone houses and extremely picturesque. And um, the interesting thing is that one of the the real duelists upon whom uh, Joseph Conrad based the characters, the, in fact, the Harvey Keitel character, is actually buried in that village, can you believe it, or that town? Wow. Yeah, which is, uh, which is great. Yeah, great little factoid. Um, and yes, yeah, so, but by the end of the film, sort of toward, basically at the end of the Napoleonic era, when sort of France has really been through the ringer, they've just been fighting for, well, you know, the whole of Europe had, um, and the character, so rather than the sort of, uh, uh, you know, braid and all that sort of stuff, uh, instead you have these characters with limps and scars and eye patches and no braid or epaulets whatsoever. And um, the the sort of transformation of the sort of country. The the other thing that stuck in stuck out was the fact that the final duet, without giving too much away, is with uh, pistols rather than swords. Previous previously they've all been using swords, mm -hmm. and um, so this is. I wondered if this was something to do with the sort of the um, technological pro. Uh, progress, so they're sort of moving from the age of swords to the age of gunpowder, in a way. Um, but actually, um, and I think that is part of it, but uh, Joseph Conrad mentions in the book that the real reason that they decided to opt for guns, uh, pistols, is that they were both too badly injured to actually fight with swords anymore. <laughs> <laughs> they couldn't manage it. <laughs> So uh, well, that makes sense because they've they've spent quite a lot of time uh, just the wounds that they incurred when they were fighting each other, but then they're also you know they had real the, life battles Russian as well campaign and the, you know where where they would have uh, experienced quite a lot of hardship and, and a lot of physical wear and tear. Exactly, and, and the, the the film kind of covers a period of what about sort of fifteen twenty years, doesn't it? So yeah, so you would think that they're getting older. Their bodies have seen a lot of uh, trauma uh, of one kind or another, so you would uh, understand if physically they might uh, be a little less able to prance and dance about, um, you know, doing uh, fancy sword moves. <laughs> exactly. 
What did you make of all the cameos? Because you mentioned about some of the, the people who pop up in the cast. Oh, uh, yes. Well, also, it's Pete Postlethwaite. Pete Postlethwaite's yes. first film. Yes, I did I did uh, spot him uh, in a small role. Liz yeah. Smith, isn't it, who later worked with Victoria Wood, uh, died yeah. recently, I think, as well. Um, and actually, the, the narrator is uh, Stacy Keach, actually. So uh, it's quite a, a, a famous uh, American star of the 70s. Okay. Um, so he, he just does the, the little voiceover narrations through various points of the film. Right. And that was interesting. I didn't realize that till I read a little bit afterwards when I was sort of preparing for the show that, um, that oh, I, I went, oh, because I did think I kind of vaguely recognized the voice, but I didn't really think much of it. Right. It's actually Stacey Keach, who'd, who'd done a, um, what the, the, I don't know if it was before or after, but he he worked with Keith Carradine, I think, in the in a couple of films. Um, they're in the Long Riders together, aren't they? The uh, okay. Is that what it's called, yeah. So, um, so anyway, that was interesting. And Albert Finney's in it, and Edward Fox. But they're just little sort of brief kind of cameo parts, aren't they? Yeah. Um, yeah. Very good, like really good sort of pivotal moments. Uh, but uh, but they are just kind of in there as as little, um, you know, cameo appearances that pop up. So that makes the yeah. film quite interesting as well. That you get some quite uh, major sort of film stars of the 70s they just kind of pop up in these little cameos so yes I that was interesting well i like the fact that loads of the faces seem to be quite some sort of early 19th century faces rather than 20th century faces if you know what i mean mm. they were they weren't sort of necessarily sort of pretty looking people they were sort of i don't know a lot of character um yeah, no, I, yeah. I really like all the so many sort of great character actors in it really yeah, yeah, it's uh, it, it is a really it's a worthwhile film um, to check out. Um, how can you see it, Jonathan? Because I know right now I'm not uh, um, like I don't know if it's streaming anywhere. I'm yeah, sure it is. It is. Yeah. It's streaming on YouTube, um, Google Play, and Apple TV, where you uh, have to um, pay for it. So on mm-hmm. YouTube and Google Play, it's only two pounds forty-nine. Isn't too much. It's also on Amazon Prime Video and Paramount Plus as well. So oh, brilliant! So you don't have to. And I, I know it. that yeah. for for uh, people who like physical media, I don't think that there is a uh, current domestic um, Blu-ray uh, that's available. It might be available on DVD, uh, but I know uh, imprint in Australia. Uh, they're either either they have just released it or it's upcoming, but they are uh, releasing a Blu-ray edition. So uh, you can go and check that out. Imprint's a great label uh, based in Australia that do a lot of, uh, they've done some really uh, interesting reissues in the last little while of sort of films that, that haven't had proper sort of Blu-ray releases. So yeah. um, if, if you're people like myself who collect uh, physical media, uh, you might want to go and visit their uh, website. They're called Via Vision is the company okay. that, that runs in print. Well, last thing I'd say before um, we move on to the next film is that Ridley Scott's new film coming out this summer is mm. also a return to the Napoleonic era. Um, so his new film is called, I think it's just called Napoleon, and it has uh, Joaquin Phoenix playing uh, the man himself, and um, I'm really looking forward to it, I have to say. Sounds great. Well, his last film uh, was called The Duel, wasn't it? Yeah. Or The Last Duel, wasn't it? The Last it? Duel, yeah. Yeah, the one with Matt Damon. And, and that's actually, I quite, I thought that was a very good film, but I, I don't think it, it um, uh, went over particularly well for some reason. I think yeah. that we were still kind of a little bit in the pandemic. Yeah. Kind of, you know, cinemas were just sort of kicking back in. So I, I don't think... Um, the film really found an audience, but I would recommend that one uh, as well. As, again, based on a an actual uh, historical incident, and it's uh, that that's quite a good film that's worth checking out. Brilliant, thank you. Right, right. so <laughs> right, let's move on to uh, the film that I recommended this time, uh, which is uh, very much based around the sword. And uh, the the act of uh, 
ritual suicide, as I mentioned at the beginning, just one of the great uh, classics of Japanese yeah. cinema. And uh, Jonathan, I'll uh, hand it over to you to talk about your impressions. Well, it's very impressive. I mean, a beautiful film, as, as much as anything else. Um, it's very, it's got that sort of st still quality. Actually, the, I don't think that the Julius has it's quite a lot of stillness in it as well. But stillness is a quality in films you don't get too much nowadays, as we said. No, but, no, everything's quite rapid and moves along at a, at a pace, whereas yeah. the two films we're talking about today uh, quite, quite, um, are, are quite deliberately deliberate in the way that they are paced. And, and in the case of Harry Carey, it's very much uh, the film very slowly builds up attention up, uh, up until the big kind of climactic moments. Yeah. Doesn't it? Yeah, it does. And <clears throat> first of all, I have to say, I was a little bit confused because there's a certain amount of sort of jumping around in time. So there's these characters, uh, one person tells a story and then, uh, then it goes to somebody else's story. And there's, um, it seems like the sort of slightly stories within stories. Um, and, but after a bit, that sort of, you, you get to know the characters and um, that it all becomes uh, clearer. But, and you're sort of, it's, it's, it's an enjoyable film, but I hope it's not let, letting the cat out of the bag, but there's actually no fighting until really quite far into the film. Mm. And, um, but it still definitely, you know, catches your attention and you want to know what's happening. Also you want to know, when's the fight gonna start? For goodness sake. <laughs> the film kind of peels the story away it, it kind of doesn't t say it chronologically it sort of it starts with a, a basic uh, sort of uh, situation and then just slowly builds on that and goes a little bit each character tells a different part of the story and as, gradually as it develops things begin to fall into place and you start to realize what's really going on yeah Exactly. Did um, you want to tell tell people a little bit about just like the very the, sort of the setup? Yes. So there is um, a samurai t turns up at uh, a sort of man I think it's a, a manor house essentially, a uh, sort of large um, house with a sort of courtyard in it, and he tells them that he wants to commit Harry Carey or seppuku, as it's more properly known. Uh, which is basically a sort of ritual suicide. It's pretty gory. You basically have to sort of stab yourself in the stomach and sort of chop out your insides whilst before you die. And it's ex obviously extremely painful. <clears throat> and it's um, something that I think that basically only samurais do. And essentially, we learn that um, Japan has a ronin problem. And um, so ronins are samurai who don't have a master anymore. So essentially, they might have been killed, or as we learn, that many of them have been laid off. There's basically they've got high unemployment, and you sort of think, yes. Oh, well, that's... this the film just just to set the context is that it takes place uh, just after sort of the uh, the the shogunate, as they're called, sort of uh, consolidated, because up till that time, I guess Japan. And again, I apologize to any Japanese listeners out there about my very sketchy. Uh, simplistic um, take on Japanese history, but there was basically a lot of different factions throughout the country who were always constant, constantly fighting and vying for power. And eventually all that was sort of consolidated. Basically just one, one person Central came out on top. Yes. And, and what happened is they sort of disbanded some of these clans throughout the country. And, and in some cases in, you know, by literally dispatching them more or, or, or otherwise uh, just, uh, uh, you know, put, yeah. putting an end to their, to their uh, little fiefdoms, if you will. So then, so then, as you say, what happened was, is all of their kind of retainers, their sort of private armies, if you will, of, of uh, samurais were basically put out of work and had nowhere nowhere to go and no sort of visible means of, of supporting themselves because yeah. they were not, their services were no longer required. 
No. <clears throat> they, uh, they were, so there's, yeah, there's these poor samurais who they don't just have the indignity of uh, being poor, but they also have the indignity of they're not fighting anymore. And that's what they do. That's their raison d'etre. Mm. And um, so this guy goes to the, uh, the lord in that, uh, that sort of house of E, I think it's called, and he says, I want to commit suicide. And so there's a sort of debate about it. And anyway, basically it goes horribly wrong. And um, it's a rather, that's pr pretty uh, gory, you could say. And um, then another uh, samurai comes along later on. And you wonder what his story is. It seems to be a sort of similar sort of thing. He wants to commit suicide because he's also unemployed and um, would rather uh, t take his life through uh, seppuku rather than live in poverty and but then uh, and they say sure you can do that um, and but he sort of sits down and before he does the act he tells his story and this is the story that sort of encompasses the previous guy and himself and sort of wider Japanese society and um, it's sort of well, basically, it exposes the hypocrisy of the samurai system and their sort of code of honor, you could say. Mm. And yeah, it's uh, and then and it finishes off with this almighty fight, which must have influenced uh, Quentin Tarantino's Kill Bill. Must have done <laughs> one oh, of my many I'm films. Quite sure. <laughs> yes, yes, I'm quite sure it did indeed. And I mean, the thing is that with, with Kobayashi's uh, films. The, this is a theme that runs throughout his, his uh, entire sort of catalogue of films is, is the fact that um, he, he, his films are kind of about individuals uh, who, who try to, to stand up to authority or the, the kind of prevailing sort of um, society at the time, the, the, the sort of the conformity and the you know the, the things that are, are going on around them and how their yeah. personal principles clash with that and that is kind of a running theme throughout you know the majority of, of his films uh and in this one in particular it, it was his first sort of historical film uh, oh, okay uh you know the, the you know sort of calling on that because obviously in japan these sort of historical uh, you know samurai films were quite popular genre yeah um uh, but here he kind of turns the whole thing on its head by sort of rather than sort of celebrating it and and uh, seeing the, these people as heroic and great sort of uh, warriors with a uh, with a great on, honor and code of, of ethics and things he kind of he shows he turns that upside down and shows the hypocrisy uh, of authority figures yeah, and was... how they use these rituals and things as a way of, of um, subjugating people. Um, I was surprised how... by that. I, I thought all samurai films were basically sort of accepted the samurai code without question. And yeah. they, they, they didn't question it. And But then it turns out there is well, at least this one. But then I have to say, I don't know much about samurai films. Um, so, uh, well, there, I, there I, are so... others. There are others, but I think this is a key one because I kind of think it was the first one that, that kind of turned, uh, turned it inside out, these codes and rituals and things, what they really, how they really impact um, the individuals. Yeah. And, 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 you just, and really the film at its heart, is, it's about hypocrisy. Uh, and how how these these people? Because you mentioned about the the chap at the beginning, the first Ronan who comes to the says, "Hey, I want to use your place to commit suicide," um, uh, but he's obviously uh, poor, and and the, the idea is that a lot of these uh, Ronans were going to these places as a way that they hoped to to have two outcomes when they'd come and say, oh, I want to, to come here and commit suicide, to die honorably because I'm poor and I can't work and 
I'm a bit useless, so I, I need to, I, I just want to die honorably uh, by committing suicide. But what they actually hoped the, the outcome of that was going to be is one of two things that they'd either be offered a job. Yep. People would say, oh, these guys are so honorable and so brave and, and uh, everything that here, come and work for us uh, and join our crew. Yep. Or... Uh, apparently a lot of times the outcome would be that they would just give them some money to go away. They'd say here, yeah, pay them or, off. Yeah, I'll pay you off, go away and, and stop bothering us. Yeah. So the, this chap shows up there, obviously with that hope. Uh, so when they actually say they go away and they talk about it and they say, God, these guys are going to keep coming to us, asking us for handouts or asking us for jobs and stuff. We need to try and discourage that. So that's kind of the, how the film starts is that these guys sit down and they all talk amongst themselves and say, look, we got to, we got to stop these guys from coming around. So let's call this guy's bluff. Yeah. <laughs> so when they go back to him, they say, okay, you can use our place and you can do your Harry carry. You can see in his face. He's like, Oh, I wasn't, I wasn't expecting that. No. And then uh, as it, it progresses, there's quite a key scene in that early part of the film where he goes to they basically force him to go through with it even though he obviously didn't really want to go through with it and then because he was so poor he'd obviously pawned his actual sword and his uh and his uh knife you know the the, the, yep. the, the knife that would be used for the ritual and he's he's just been carrying around bamboo virgin versions of it yeah so they so they then uh, insist that he use those instead of providing him with actual sharp, you know, proper swords. So it adds another dimension of sort of cruelty to this, to this. It's forcing extremely him. cruel. Extremely yes. cruel. And, and apparently these, the, the, this, Basically he has uh, to try and disembowel himself with a wooden spoon sort of thing. <laughs> Basically. You know. Yeah. And it's really a horrible sort of scene and, and, the, the and apparently when the film came out this was a key thing that sort of critics and people jumped on about because obviously this is 1962 nowadays we're used to much more graphic depictions of violence yeah. and films and things but in 1962 this was quite a horrendous sort of moment to, yeah in a, like the a very uncomfortable like extreme bit of cinema for people mm. to sit through so so that was a, a key thing that, that that kind of critics and things picked up on to say you know to say this film goes too far and it's too horrible and it's too yeah. this I can imagine uh, and also. it is a very intense uh, scene isn't it very yeah um you know um uh, and it kind of sets the stage for that the, this kind of these guys their their act of kind of casual cruelty to this young man who's come you know, obviously, because he's he's down on his luck and he's come to them essentially for help, uh, and they've yeah. they've taken this set of decisions and the the way that they chose to handle that situation. Then that ties into what happens when the other chap shows up, and yeah. he uh, comes and asks to do the same thing. Yeah. So basically. Uh, just so that the, the, our listeners can understand a little bit about where the, the, the story and the kind of key uh, key points that Jonathan was talking about. Yeah, it's uh, that that scene with the the Harry Carey with um, the bamboo sword is very harrowing, it really is. Um, and but there was a scene. I'm sure that the sort of one of the people earlier on said. You can get out of this before go well, go now, rather than sort of insist on it. Uh, but 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 the trouble, part of the problem is the sort of their cruelty. But part of the problem also is his sort of feeling that he has to abide by their uh, code of honor, by the samurai's code of honor. Mm. Um, and that sort of pushes him into it as well. And I guess this is one of the themes of the film is the sort of conflict between ritual and flexibility. Um, Indeed. The, because the, sort of the samurais, uh, samurai, sort of, it's a highly ritualized sort of system. 
but funnily enough, one of their big influences is Buddhism, which is also very ritualized, but it's also one of their big sort of teachings is really sort of flexibility, isn't it? Sort of basically not, it is not, indeed. Not attachment. And, but they're seriously attached to their uh, ritual and their sort of, you know, uh, their, their, their hearts are not open. Let's put it like that. Yes, and at heart, it's an authoritarian system, isn't it? These yeah. are these are people who are in positions of, of power, yeah. and and everyone is expected to be part of this code of honor. Is just plain subservience, isn't it? It's about it's yeah. about doing what you're told, not failing or else. Yeah. And you know there is there is that that serious kind of authoritarianism and the abuse of it which I think is central key to the film. And, yeah. it's, and it's also, as I said, that's a theme that runs through a lot of Kobayashi's films is, is that that uh, conflict between the individual uh, and, uh, and, and that, you know, that subservience to, to societal authority and the, the submissiveness to uh, authority figures and things like that. Yes. Even when it's not in your own best interest. Yeah, yeah. And there's a, there's a few sort of points which I suppose are similar between the two films which you haven't mentioned. One is the sort of um, uh, sort of domestic uh, situation with both sort of, because they're sort of warriors in both cases, the sort of heroes of both films. And, but there's also, they're not just warriors, they're also sort of family men. Or become family men and there's that sort of conflict between the sort of the, the martial valor and the um uh, sort of domestic arrangement um and um another thing that struck me is that in the fight at the end it finishes off funny enough with guns um and uh, <laughs> so they both both films move from sort of swords and uh to yeah to guns uh, which is sort of an interesting thing. I suppose that's that's the future, isn't it? Um, and maybe less sort of intimate, because at least when you're fighting, you're sort of, you can't really avoid your enemy. You're basically pretty close up to them. Whereas when you're shooting at them, you can sort of, you don't even have to see them, barely. Uh, yeah. And I think in Harry Carey, that, that sort of underlines, again, that theme about the hypocrisy, because at the end, all the, the systems and things that these gents claim to um, uphold, yeah. in the end, they take the easy sort of cowardly option of, of getting the guns out yeah. and not, not having to deal directly and use you know, what they purport to be their highly skilled swordsmanship. Yeah, swordsmanship and, and fighting to strict guidelines and of honor and integrity and things. But in the end, when when that seems to be failing them, they resort to just, um, you know, bludgeoning power instead in, in, in getting the upper hand. Yeah, yeah, so, that's, so, that, that's, the, that's uh, in fact, that's the sort of, the final damning remark, isn't it? They, they're just using guns. They can't even use their swords anymore. Those so-called samurai. Yeah. But it's, it's lovely and nice and subtle throughout the film how the, the, the main character, sorry, who's, who's uh, played by Te Tetsuo Nakadai, sorry, I always want to make sure I say his, his name correct, he's, he's a really a great sort of seminal actor in Japanese film of this period and right. he was in Kobayashi's uh, human condition as well he's the central character in that uh, okay. uh, but he's again another actor he's kind of quite uh, I would almost liken him to someone like Harvey Keitel in the sense that he's always very he has this great intensity and he uses his eyes a lot doesn't he in the in the film and he's got this really deep rich voice that he really uses to great effect right. throughout the film yeah, uh, and and he never goes. Uh, you know, he's he's always has this kind of menacing demeanor. Yeah. And in the in the early stages of the film, you really do question whether this guy is just like a little bit of a nutter. <laughs> he's kind of showed up, and he kind of keeps you know kind of pushing pushing the envelope very subtly. Yeah. Uh, 
uh, trying to kind of, uh, you know, uh, sort of push the boundaries of the situation that he's in. Yeah. And, and it's only as the film progresses that you learn a little uh, more and more about uh, who he is and what his relationship is to the other characters and why he's there. Uh, and, and it's done, uh, you know, in this just really gradual way that builds up tension so nicely. Yeah, it does. Because uh, even though, you know, the film it, it just clocks in a little bit over two hours, but like I literally, it could, it kind of feels like 20 minutes to me when I watch it because yeah. it, it does, it just has this uh, palpable tension to it and sort of, you know, that, that, that you're always constantly feeling like what's going on, what's going to happen, what is this all about, mm. who is this guy, you know, and you, you really have that that in there throughout. Yeah. I see that uh, Tetsuya Nakadai is still alive, 91 now. Yeah, good age. <laughs> well, he's definitely he's he's been in some great things. He's in like sort of Doom, and he's in some others as well. He's right. uh, he's he, he is a really really great actor, uh, and uh, you know I think this is obviously one of his sort of key roles as well. Uh, yeah, sort of it's sort of from his sort of prime days, and uh, and it's uh, such a great film. I mean, I love the bit too when they, because you talk about the, the stillness and the use of the, the camera being very still and just the slow, gradual pans and and, and, and zooms that they use to yes. kind of tracking shots as well. The ocean. But Easy. then at the end, towards the end, when they have that moment, that, that incredible walk through the cemetery, which is just this amazing, yes. it's almost kind of worth watching the film just alone for that moment when these uh, two chaps walk through the cemetery and the, the, it's a, a windy, very blustery day and the, the trees, the way they undulate in the background while they're walking through this huge, just massive cemetery that just seems at these endless yeah. sort of, uh, you know, headstones all together these little little temples and things throughout and it's just like a just a stunning uh kind of visual uh moment that that just kind of is jaw-dropping to look at yeah and then uh then they go out to this field to have this this uh well duel if you will this samurai sword is a duel, yeah, isn't uh and then that's the first time where he starts to use kind of uh, off angles with the camera to kind of convey that that kind of sense of uh, you know what's going to happen, right, whereas yeah. whereas the, throughout the film you haven't had that. No, uh, uh, you know you've had these kind of still and kind of static images, and then all of a sudden you have these kind of weird angles and, and yeah. uh, the, these amazing cloud formations in the background that kind of really help convey. Wind in the grass is extraordinary. I, wrote, I sort of noted that. Another uh, actor in this film that uh, is probably worth mentioning is. Tetsuro Tamba, and hmm. he was later in the James Bond film. Oh, um, right, which one? He was in You Only Live Twice, Tiger Tanaka. Oh, right. oh brilliant. Which was made uh, just five years later, actually. Um, but I, I guess, well, it's, it's funny to see that Samurai's sort of economic problems, um, because I don't, I don't suppose... Well, I, I'd always thought of samurais just sort of purely, uh, you know, fighting, um, and, and not think of them in, within a sort of economic uh, context. And that was really interesting. And that's sort of family, and yeah, it's ter terrific movie. And then and then you get this amazing fight at the end, which goes on for probably about twenty minutes of you know, extraordinary. One of the, yeah, it must be one of the best fights in martial arts. Sort of movie history I'd imagine mm. extraordinary stuff yeah. yeah it is amazing and it'd be because the film has, has, has spent this time very carefully and deliberately building up that tension up into that moment that it is really quite you know it is like a sort of like this release of energy isn't it that uh, that is kind of built up great all right well well Jono that um, I think um, we might have to wrap it up there yep Sounds um, good, but um, but uh, I think uh, we're we're in agreement on both of the films really that they're definitely worth searching out. Definitely. Um, if listeners are interested in seeing uh, Harry Carey, 
Um, we did uh, try to find uh, some places where it's available for streaming in the United Kingdom at the minute. Uh, and I'm afraid we came up with very little there, uh, but it is available in a really, really great Blu-ray edition from the Masters of Cinema Eureka, uh, the Masters of Cinema label. So definitely um, that is worth picking up. Um, and uh, I believe it's available on, on Blu-ray from Criterion in the U.S. as well. And I would imagine um, in for, for any listeners out in the U.S. that, that Harry Carey is probably on the Criterion channel there streaming service i'd be very surprised if it wasn't um so anyway go and search it out um it's definitely it is a keeper so it's definitely worth going out and buying buying a, a blu-ray if, uh, you know, absolutely it's worth having on your shelf and it's the kind of film that you can go back and revisit every once in a while and it's uh, it's it's really that great so uh go and check it out yeah um so, Jonathan, before we um, wrap up for today, I just wanted to give a shout out to one of our listeners. Uh, we, we put a little uh, Q&A on our Spotify page on Anchor FM, and uh, we had a listener who responded. Um, last uh, episode, we talked about substance abuse films. We did. And, uh, and uh, I just put a little question out there, just asking people uh, if they had other recommendations for uh, films uh, about substance abuse that they uh, would like to suggest. Uh, and uh, we had uh, Prague Research 67 came uh, back yes. and, uh, and said the 7% solution. Uh, and I thought that was an interesting uh, choice, actually, because that, that's a, a cool sort of uh, twist on the Sherlock Holmes uh, uh, thing. It's a Sherlock Holmes film, basically, but it kind of does focus a bit on the the idea of his uh drug addiction and his re reliance on opiates and okay. cocaine and things I've like seen that, that film. i hadn't even heard of that film oh yeah well i did to be fair i haven't seen it for quite a long time but but definitely i'm uh, so we really appreciate prog research uh putting that out there because uh, that's quite an interesting uh suggestion yeah, for a uh, nice viewing i love so uh, so sounds good yeah lovely uh so that's great and uh listeners uh if you uh want to touch base with us and make any comments uh about the films that we uh, talked about tonight or you have any other suggestions uh, about uh sword related sword play films that you'd uh, mm -hmm. want to tell us about then by all means uh, come and find us we're on facebook if you just look for film swap the podcast We've got a little group there that you can come join. We're also now on Twitter, so you can find us at FilmSwap UK. Uh, and we're also on Instagram and TikTok at the, with the same moniker, so you can come find we're us. so social, aren't we? we? We're becoming very sociable. And also, uh, we're on YouTube as well, so for people who uh, prefer to use a browser to uh, access the show, we've got a YouTube channel. So uh, again, if you uh, come and find us at Film Swap, the podcast, just look for the two stunningly handsome male models pointing at each other, yeah. uh, standing in front of uh, some film projectors. That's us. Come and find us. And uh, we'd uh, love to hear from you. We'd love to hear your comments and suggestions and any feedback uh, about the show. Anyway, we'll, we'll sign off for now, folks, and uh, we'll see you next time on... Film swap. Film swap. See you then. Bye. Film swap. 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 Oh, shut your gob. You talk too much.